to prevent this violence from taking place. They simply haven't. There were town hall style meetings, much like this. Government officials were present and they were strategizing about how to drive Muslims out of their villages, how to drive Kaman and Rohingya Muslims out of their villages. We know this has happened. And, and as has been mentioned earlier, uh, this all took place with complete impunity. Um, so uh, there's a lot of information as well that hasn't been publicly released, but that should be released. We know the UN has information about systematic rape that took place after the waves of violence. This information has not been released publicly. Senior UN officials know about it. Um, we know that there's systematic, we've actually documented systematic forced labor, particularly in northern Rakhine State. So I'm talking about thousands upon thousands of cases of forced labor, men, women, and children being forced by the military uh, to repair roads, repair barracks. This has been happening for a very long time. There's information about this. Again, senior officials know about this. Governments know about it. Information is being suppressed. What they're saying is that it's too sensitive to address head on. And as a result, nothing gets addressed at all. Uh, and it just continues. Uh, and, and I think events like this are essential uh, because we have to send the message that that's unacceptable. We have to put an end to these abuses. It has to stop. Um, we've heard a lot about the IDP camps, um, and, and these aren't typical IDP camps. The people in these camps can't leave. They're confined to these camps. This isn't just a, a typical situation of internal displaced persons. Um, these are more appropriately referred to as internment camps or as concentration camps, as we heard in the last presentation. Um, in, in, yeah, in February uh, 2014, we released a report exposing um, policies of persecution. And these were state policies. Uh, uh, there were 12 internal government documents that we obtained that, um, that uh, explain uh, a very long period of abuse against the Rohingya population. Uh, they uh, illustrate or, or set forth policies restricting freedom of movement, marriage, childbirth, these things that we've heard about, um, uh, that we've heard about here today. Um, official orders from 1993 to 2009 uh, outline consistent uh, restrictions on marriage imposed against the Rohingya population. Um, the two-child policy has led to unsafe abortions. It has led to death. It has led women to flee the country. Um, and, and, and this is still happening today. Um, I think just as a final point, uh, these policies, as all of you know, are no secret. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a major expose. We, we, of course, uh, they were talked about for a very long time. And, and when we released the report, it was the first time the actual policies had been released. But it was no secret. Um, and we've got uh, evidence of, of senior government officials talking about these policies on record, in some cases in parliament. Um, and, and in our estimation, the abuses just contained in that report alone constitute the crime against humanity of persecution. There are other crimes against humanity uh, that I think are worth uh, very close and careful attention. Forced population transfer is a crime against humanity. Forced deportation persecution, uh, and, of, and of course there is a, a, a very um, serious argument to be made about the crime of genocide uh, taking place. So um, I'll leave it at that, and, and again I just I thank you all for, for, uh, for your time, and um, I'm happy to have conversations with all of you uh, in the time that we've got after this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Um, the next speaker is Odni Gumar, who is the Executive Director of Partners Relief and Development in Norway. She's a humanitarian aid worker with 20 years of experience in Burma, and I understand has been working in Rakhine State for the last three years. Mm -hmm. Please. Thank you. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. That's the goal. Um, I want to thank everybody, too, for still staying here, and I don't see anybody sleeping, so this is a good sign. Uh, thank you for, for arranging this conference. It's been said before, and I don't think it can be said many times enough. Um, it's so nice to be together with so many people who are fighting for the same thing. And I don't know if you experience the same as I do many times, and that is that 
when you're working with the Rohingya, you feel very alone. <coughs> and um, I go and speak in groups of people, I ask people if they've ever heard of the Rohingya people, and very, very seldom has anybody even heard about this people group. Um, the last week's events, I think, have changed that. Uh, but still, it's a lonely job. Um, I think everything that can be said has been said here already today. Um, and um, I don't think I have a lot of new things to add. But I wanted to share with you some of my per personal experiences working as an aid organization, trying to do relief and development among the Rohingya people in Sitwe in particular. Um, one question that we have asked ourselves many times, and it's a, it's a, it sounds like a callous question, um, because we work with people who are so hungry and they don't have any food. And many of you have been to Sitwe, and many of you have met these people, and you've met the mothers that have come to you and pointed to their mouth and showed you how many, with fingers how many days it's been since last time they ate. And then they point to their children. And you understand that it's not just them who haven't eaten, but their children haven't eaten. And for us in partners, we are a small organization and we like to act fast. We, we don't have a wheel that has to take three weeks to get the food to the people who are starving. Uh, we are able to get relief into the camps very quickly. But the question we have asked us many times is, OK, so we feed them for a week. <coughs> then what? Are we just prolonging their death? They're going to die if nothing happens. And this sounds like a really harsh thing to say, but we've actually felt that many times. I remember in the beginning when we were in Sitwe and we were treating, we had a little clinic set up and, and uh, lines, hundreds of people. I mean, there were, no, there were no clinics, no medical people in the beginning. And we were trying to treat all these sick people. And the same question arose in my head, and I think in many of our nurses, was these babies, malnourished babies came, and the mothers were holding them. And you know this baby is not going to survive. This baby is not going to live. But we gave them some formula anyway, because the baby was starving. But we thought, OK, that might give the baby another week or two. But then what? And that's why I think it's so good to be here and to hear you talk about lasting change. Because the thing is, as an aid organization doing relief, that's just putting a Band-Aid on the wound. It doesn't change the real problem. And we can keep giving them rice for the rest of our lives, but that's not going to change um, the situation for the Rohingya. I wanted to share with you a few stories. One of a mother whose name is Noor Bagan. She's 35 years old, and she's the mother of six. Uh, she was the mother of eight. She, was, she gave birth to premature twins. And when she gave birth to these twins, uh, her husband was very ill. And the twins were premature, and the delivery was very difficult. And as you all know, there are no medical. I mean, there, there, are, there are sometimes, there are doctors in the area but very seldom. She wasn't able to get treatment, and she was desperate to get help. And she knew that if she had a little bit of money, she could maybe get some help from one of the clinics. And so she sold her food ration uh, for 30 US dollars. The food ration is what you know, ensures that you get food twice a month. She sold it for $30, and with that money, she was able to get some medicine for herself, for her twins, and for her husband. Well, her yeah. husband died, and then her twins died also. She was left now with no food ration and six children that she had to feed. Plus, she has tuberculosis, um, which is a sickness that is on the rise in, in all the camps that we are working in. So now she's a widow. She lost two brand new babies, and she has no food to feed her children. Um, Another father, we were trying, we were thinking, okay, how can we, how can we help them with more than just giving rice? What's something we can do that is lasting, that is more sustainable? So we had this great idea. We're going to give them goats. If they have goats, they'll be able to have meat, or they can sell the goats and they can make an income. We thought this was a great idea, great development work. 
And so we bought about 100 goats and we gave it to different families. And some months later when we went back, we met this one father and he fell down in front of my, my teammates' feet and cried and sobbed and begged for forgiveness. And he said, I'm so, so sorry, but we were so hungry. We had nothing to eat, so we had to kill the goat that you gave us and, it, and we had to eat the goat. I was talking to um, a young lady who we've, been wor who we've worked with, well-educated, she's bright, she's brilliant, her sister is also, and uh, we were talking about education in the camps. And she said that we have schools now, the government allows us to have school for our children, and I thought, that's great, that's one positive thing that's happening. But she said, but the problem is, we have no teachers. And she said, this is the government, again, trying to systematically destroy our nation. Because they'll say, oh yeah, we have schools there. We're letting our, the Rohingya start schools. But what good is a school when there is no teacher to teach? She said that uh, the teachers that are teaching in that school are illiterate themselves. So how are they going to be able to teach the children? We were thinking, uh, a few months back, we were again thinking, okay, now, we need to figure out a way to sustain the food supply. The rice they're getting is not enough. Um, first of all, it's not enough. Second of all, if you only eat rice, you get malnourished. They need some more vegetables and, and, and some more protein in their diet. So we thought, we'll lease some land around the camps. If we lease land and we give them seeds, these people were farmers before, so what's holding them back from growing their own vegetables? So we thought, this is a great idea. We were so proud of ourselves for this great idea, until we found out that it's impossible. Rohingya can't lease or own land, so it was hopeless. Even though the land is right there, there was nothing the Rohingya could do on the land. And so this kind of illustrates how hard it is to do relief work with the Rohingya. Not because the Rohingya are difficult, but because this situation is hopeless. I have, we have worked for the last few years with the people who have not been registered by the UN. It was mentioned earlier that uh, getting the rations that the UN gives is already in, not enough. It's a little bit, it's better than not eating anything, but it's not an adequate diet. Well, imagine the ones who are not registered by the UN, who don't get any rations at all. How do they survive? Like Matt said, they're not able to leave the camps. They're not able to grow anything. So how are they going to survive? We have heard, and I, I, I say this kind of with caution, but we have heard that as many as 40% of the people in Sitwe, 40% of the 140 have not been registered, which means that those people are not getting rations from the UN. These people are starving, and those are the people that we have been trying to help over the past years. We've been helping one community in particular who the government have said will not get registered no matter how hard they try. And the reason is that during the violence in 2012, two Buddhist leaders were killed in their, in their village. And as a punishment for three years, these people have not been able to get registered and they have not been able to get any food, any rations, no tarps for their houses, no nothing. And these are the people that we are trying to help. You know, the embassy in Norway said that it's gotten better. And in a way, I think it's true. I mean, if you were there three years ago, it was complete miser misery. I mean, there were no toilets. And so you had to watch everywhere you were walking. No showers. The houses were t very, very bad. And now when you go there, there are toilets, and there is more structure. But to me, that means the situation is much worse. And the reason is it's, it's built to be permanent. It's looking like the government is thinking that this is how it's going to be now. And I think that in many, many ways, that is a lot worse than it was three years ago. So with that, I just want to say thank you again. And like Matt, I am around. And I would love to talk to you because um, there is a lot of wisdom in this room. And I would like to pick all your brains. And uh, thank you for listening and not falling asleep. Thank you, Odni. Um, the instruction that I have from Zarni, is Zarni here right now? 
Yeah. Is that we open for uh, question and answer? Is that correct? Yes. Uh, In spite of the time that we do, that we take the time for that. You, yeah, you yeah, tell sure. me. Sure. Yeah. And then we've got one more panel. Yeah. And, oh. then, uh, yeah, and it says here fifteen minutes. Is that correct? Um, I think I would just say ten minutes. Okay. Because <laughs> we know. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, yeah, but you all stay for dinner. Yeah. So you can. Okay, uh, then I think the way that we do this is that um, we open for uh, at least three questions and then uh, responses to whoever you want to respond to. The questions are under one minute each, okay? Otherwise, we, we use all the time. So the person in the back first, please. Uh, thank you, my name is... Is there a microphone? Probably loud enough for that one. Uh, just a minute, there's a microphone coming. Um, <coughs> Briefly, you, please. Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Catherine Willard. I work for Independent Diplomat. We focus on getting access to diplomacy and policy for marginalised groups. Um, my question to the panellists is really, what does the international community need to do now? And I want to go back to the call this morning from Archbishop Tutu for proper conditions on development assistance, for instance, which I see is the number one recommendation also from the Holocaust uh, Museum study. Um, but development assistance seems to me a small part of the picture. The leverage lies surely in trade and investment policy. Do you see any examples of good practice of actually attaching proper conditions on any of this? Is there anybody who's showing and leading the way in terms of putting pressure on the government, saying we must improve the conditions in this and this way before we provide um, assistance or go ahead with cooperation? Okay, thank you. So a question about conditionality of aid and uh, leverage uh, related to trade and investment. Uh, yes, number two. Is the, can you send the mic, please? Please be brief. My question is, uh, since we have a lot of uh, speakers, a lot of uh, experts on human rights and international law, and so on, my question will be to them, any of you, what will be next? It's very similar to my question. How you gonna bring, or how you gonna bring uh, or international community to find a solid solution instead of loving, you know, most persecuted people or things like that? Because we need strong action. Please. Okay, so a question about uh, response of the international community again. How do you persuade the international community? Can we send the mic there, please? Uh, I am too really wrong. I'm a, <coughs> and, uh, I'm a, Professor at the Norwegian Center for Human Rights. I have a question to actually do to you more than anybody. Uh, what is, in your best understanding, very briefly, the purpose, the aim, and the problem analysis of those who persecute, who try to annihilate, annihilate Rohingyas? Why the hell are they doing this? <laughs> what is their reason? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have room for one more question. If it's not similar to the first two, different kind of question? Yeah. Okay. This is the last uh, question. My question is uh, uh, sorry. about the, and from, uh, about the, the uh, fears among the Rakhine community. Uh, I think you have mentioned. Uh, and is there any way to give them real, I mean, to, to, to explore the to come into the real uh, uh, the normal vision. So this is going to be a part of the vision. Okay, thank you so much for, uh, so we had two questions that are a little similar, and then the question from Professor Lynn Holman, and then this fourth question about how to address these very real fears, however unjust, that Rakhine people have. Um, who would like to, respond to, perhaps we can take the first two questions first. I'll share some thoughts. I'd like about a month to think about each of those questions before answering them, but um, 
Uh, yeah. One minute. <laughs> one minute. Uh, yeah. Uh, the the independent diplomat. Yeah, we're, I'm familiar. Uh, I visited your office in New York actually, and uh, I'm familiar with your work, and, and uh, you do great work. So, thanks for the question. Um, in terms of what we're recommending the international community do, it's similar to what Toon Kin had recommended. Um, one thing is for an independent international investigation into human rights violations taking place in Rakhine State. Um, there's very little appetite to have a, a commission of inquiry, but um, uh, similar to what we recently saw with North Korea, for example. But um, this is something that I think is possible, um, and I think we need to be pushing for that. Another thing that we've been talking to the international community about, um, and that really needs to change, well, there's a whole lot uh, that needs to change with respect to the diplomatic community in Yangon, um, but we've been encouraging uh, uh, the, the international community, at least its representation in Yangon, to address the, the, the fact that the 82 citizenship law needs to be amended. Um, this is a conversation that has stopped taking place at the highest levels in government. And so the government of Myanmar thinks this issue this issue is forgotten. We don't have to address this anymore. So what our message to the, to the uh, diplomatic community has been is that you cannot let that discourse die because until that legislation is changed or until this, the statelessness issue is changed, we're going to see more violence, more abuse. It's a root cause um, issue. Uh, just to give you an idea, however, about what we're up against, one, one diplomat in Yangon told me that, um, in a conversation, told me that uh, uh, documenting human rights violations and releasing them uh, in, in the form of reports was, quote, a Cold War tactic. And her message to us was that it's unhelpful. It's unhelpful to document abuses. And so there's this idea that they're trying to quietly work with the government and that when the truth comes out, it just makes things more difficult. Uh, we've heard this narrative in many other contexts for a really long time. Um, we, we lean toward um, uh, the inherent value in documenting the truth, and we'll continue to do that. Um, and, and I think uh, the, and, and the special rapporteurs play an inc incredibly important role uh, in doing that. Uh, Mr. Quintana, Yang He Lee um, are, are doing a tremendous job uh, at, at that as well. Um, Matt, uh, would you like to address the question about Rakhine fears while, you're, while you have the mic since yeah, sure. it was addressed to you? Just oh, briefly, and, please. Yeah, and also to the, um, no, no one is putting conditions on, on investment or aid. It's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a gold rush in, in, in some areas. And, and most, even some humanitarian organizations don't want to discuss for kind state because they're scared that they will lose their MOU. Um, so uh, that, that's a problem. On Rakhine fears, um, I think education is essential. Uh, I wish I had a better answer to this question. Um, I've noticed in a few trusted Rakhine contacts over the last two years, their views have changed. Um, uh, some people I was in meetings with in 2012 and they were discussing how to, how to essentially burn down Muslim villages. I recently visited them again and now they're talking about how um, uh, citizenship should be granted, uh, at least to some they say. Uh, they're talking the language of human rights. They use the word Rohingya uh, and they know what happens when people get on boats and they're appalled by it. So um, we're seeing these glimmers of humanity. Uh, which has been a uh, 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 reason for hope, but uh, I think there needs to be a much bigger campaign. The government has a role to play in this. It's not, you know, the government can address these misunderstandings, the discrimination, but they're not doing that. They're feeling it. Uh, and as my colleagues said, uh, it's reaching, it's reaching uh, the most serious point, as you all know, much better than, than we do. Thank you, Matt. Um, would, would some of the other panelists like to speak to this question about uh, what is the purpose of the persecutors? People who have thought deeply uh, about these questions. Thomas, do you want to? Yeah, hear? one of the things that came up from our interviews when we asked people, the Rakhine people, what, what is it that you're worried about? What, what is the fear? And they said they're worried about genocide. They're worried about being wiped out and they say that they have been under a genocidal process at the hands of the Union government for the last 60 years. Um, they 